Uh, hi, and welcome to my talk about compound words indicating possession in Ihanzo. And for my topic, I choose to focus on three specific constructions, which were munya, which can be added to other words in order to fill new ones, mukola, which can be used to express ownership, and mugilanga, which can be used to express lack of ownership. And my research question focused on the pluralization of these words and how they can be modified using adjectives and in general how productive these forms are. And then for Mugilanga specifically, kind of how similar to Mukula this form is. Yes, and here we can see some examples for Munya words. So we have Munya Mutala or Munya Nzala. And usually we have Munya plus a singular word as in Munya Nzala. However, there are some constructions like Munya Mazui, where it's the plural that you need to use. So Mazui is jealousies, not jealousy. And if we take these constructions to be compounds, then we could say that Munya seems to be the semantic head of this construction because it's always a type of person, another type of journey, hunger, jealousy. Yeah, we have a few further examples because Munya can also be used to create clan names or rather to refer to a person from a specific clan or ethnic group. So we can have Munya Panda or Munya Nkadi. However, we cannot use Munya with all kinds of ethnic groups. We cannot say Munya Hukuma or Munya Sukuma, but in that case, you have to use muhukuma. So are there, there are some restrictions to the productivity of munya and other uh, similar forms would be, would be munilamba or munya turu. And then here we can see some more examples. So here we have munya nyota, which is kind of the opposite to munya nzala. Uh, and very interesting, well, what I found very interesting was Munya Kali, which Nico translated as somebody from long ago. However, it does not refer to a person who's now dead, but rather a person who has a lot of knowledge about the past. So maybe similar to what we consider a historian, but I'm not quite sure. And then we also have Munya Mpala, which translates as old man. However, Unlike all the other forms where you can say nyota I mean first or kali past, you cannot really separate the impala in this construction. So at best it can kind of refer to the impala, the antelope, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense here. So we can see the munya can be combined with lots of different nouns indicating time, distance, feelings, etc. What I didn't really look at, but may be interesting for future research would be if Munya could also be combined with words that are not nouns, like adjectives or adverbs. And in general, I choose to gloss the Nia as a question mark, because I know that the Nia is probably derived from a word meaning mother, but I'm not quite sure how that would translate in this case. And then so far, all the examples with Munya seem to refer to a type of person. However, we also have Munya Ngala, which means hair, or literally the one who wears the crown, the owner of the crown. So in this case, the meaning is derived through a metaphorical extension. And as far as I could tell, it's the only animal with this kind of, where this name is formed in this way. And we try to talk with Nico about that and maybe Came, we kind of came up with different ideas. So maybe it's because the hair in legend is usually seen as a smart, wise animal. So it could kind of indicate a special status. Or what's maybe more probable is that there might have been some kind of headdresses in the past made of the fur of hairs. And then I did not ask for the plural form of this word in particular. But when I collected the data for this presentation, I noticed that Andrew had already uh, had a plural form for this in uh, his data, which was Amunyangala, which if we look at the other plural forms in a moment, 
it's kind of unexpected and a bit atypical and that does make me wonder if maybe this is more, a more lexicalized form. Yeah, but I'm not sure. And here we can see the formation of the plural form. So we have Anya Kida Gu for prophets or Anya Mohinso for travelers. And we cannot have Monya Mihenso or Anya Mihenso. So it always needs, it's always the Mu in Monya that needs to change. Uh, the other class marker cannot change. However, there's one exception that I found, which is Monya Mutala. So Munya Mutala in singular means co-wife. However, we have we also have Anya Mutala, which means co-wives, and Anya Mitala, which also means co-wives. It just depends on what kind of co-wives you refer to or the group of co-wives. So uh, Anya Mutala are the co-wives of the same husband, and Anya Mitala refers to groups of co-wives of different husbands. And then we also have Munya Mitala, which refers to the husband of the co-wives. Then we can combine Munya with adjectives, for example, Munya Kidagu Mulipu, the prophet is tall. We cannot have Munya Kidagu Kilipu, so the, the class marker on the adjective always needs to reflect the Munya. We can also have an adjective in a relative construction, Munya Nzala Numulipu, or in the plural, Anyangulu Ni Alipu. And then we move on to ownership, so Mukola uh, and Akola is the plural form owners. And then we can combine that with an, so the Mukola with an adjective for Umukola Mukwata, the owner is lazy, or Umukola Mugunda, the farm owner. And here I was especially interested in how many other nouns I can combine the Mukola with. Here we see a few examples. So we can have slave owner, dog owner, car owner, well owner, and even with a diminutive form, owner of a small house. So it seems to be very productive in that sense, although I did not test it with all kinds of the nouns from all kinds of noun classes. And I also did not test Mukola with abstract nouns, although I'm guessing owner of luck or owner of happiness would not work. And then I also tried owner of a small farm, but there we discovered a lexicalized version, which is to um, Then we have plural forms. You can have akola mitoka for multiple owners of multiple cars, mukola mitoka for one owner of multiple cars, or akola mugunda for multiple owners of one farm. And although I did not test it with all the Mukola forms, I'm guessing that you can kind of combine or mix and match these plural forms uh, depending on the meaning that you want to convey. And then I had a very, very brief look at Mukula Mugunda plus an adjective, although not in any depth. Um, so we have Umukula Mugunda Numulipu, the farm owner who is tall, and you cannot put the adjective between the two nouns, which um, would be one kind of proof that this is a unit that cannot be separated. Separated, So you cannot have umokala molipu mugunda. And then I also have one example where both nouns are modified, iakola mugunda nuukulu alipu, the owners of the big farm who are tall, or the owners of the farm that is big are tall. Unfortunately, I did not list any examples where only the second noun, so only the Mugunda is modified. So that would be something to look into in the future. And then we looked at expressing ownership in a sentence. And I tried, so the idea was to elicit sentences which would have a verb that could mean to own. So in the first one just shows uh, how to use or an example of Mukola Mugunda in a sentence. We can say Andrea Mukola Mugunda Ugu, Andrew is the owner of this field. Uh, and then I tried uh, to, to get Nico to say the man owns a field or the man owns a farm, and he only gave me Umuntu Kete Mugunda, the man has a field. And I had similar issues with the other one. So this was supposed to be I have owned this farm for 10 years, 
but he gave me Umugunda Uiti Wane Miyakupumi Akile. This is my farm for the past 10 years. And the other one was supposed to be tomorrow. I will own this farm or I will own this farm tomorrow. And he gave me Muda Mugunda Ubutula Wane. Tomorrow the farm will be mine. So maybe you would need to try this with some other sentences to get the proper verb. And then in the last session, I looked at lack of possession um, using Mugilanga. And here you can see some uh, examples of how Mugilanga can be combined with other verb. Uh, words to form or to express a person who doesn't have something. For example, Mugilanga Naoli, somebody who doesn't have fair, which in the plural could be Agilanga Naoli, people who don't have fair. And you can have Mugilanga Anyenya, somebody who doesn't have children. You could also have Mugilanga Munyenya, somebody who doesn't have a child. And then we have Mugilanga Liyo, which is kind of special in that it means an inattentive person. And then we have Mugila Kupri, somebody who doesn't have ears. And here we kind of notice that these, this anger is missing in this form, and I'm, I'm not sure why or what's going on here. So that would be also something to look into more. And then we have Mugila Ngito, somebody who doesn't have a home. And I also decided here to mark the anger with a question mark because I'm not kind of sure, maybe it stands for any, maybe not, I don't know. And then I try to see how we can use these Gida Ilanga in a sentence. So you cannot say Mugilangi Cho Mulipu, or which was intended to mean the homeless person is tall. You cannot do that. You can use Mugilanga to describe a different person. So you can have Andrew Mugilanga and Kuku. And who doesn't have chickens? You can also use this construction with uh, animals or inanimate nouns like Uluzi, Lugilanga, Mazi. And here we see that the marker needs to change. Or uh, or Ikota, Igila, Anga, Nkali. And here we have again that the sometimes the Anga seems to be separated. And sometimes it's mushed together with the gila. And then I try to see if mugila, mugilanda naoli, or mugila matundu could be used as a subject of a sentence, which does not work. It cannot be the subject on its own. You always need to have some kind of copula. And here we have ni mugila matundu amujuka nahiela pangwe baga which translate roughly to, I don't have money for the bus, or I stopped, or I remained in Ibaga. And here we have another construction with the anga missing. And then at the very end, we kind of got a few more forms that don't really fit in with the rest, but also express some kind of, of either lack of ownership or just for like people who are something. So one way you can also express the lack of ownership would be mulya or mulya ito or mulya ito, somebody who doesn't have a home. And here it's interesting that there seems to be a semantic difference between mugilanga ito and mulya ito, although I'm not quite sure what the difference is. I think it has something to do with missing the home. And you can use mulya ito or mulya ito with an adjective unlike Mugilanga, so you can have Mulietu Mulipu, and you can also say where Mulitu, you are a homeless person, or, uh, or where Mugilangitu, you are a homeless person. And then we have a special form, Muhitito or Muhita Ito, somebody who refuses to have a home. And then we got Mulindela Nyumba, somebody who takes care of the house of somebody else when the owners are away, or Musala Myumba, the inhabitor of the house. Yes. Thank you for listening, Sangedi. Are there any questions? First of all, Friederika Songalan Nuewe, thank you uh, for this uh, talk. Uh, these forms were things that I had 
encountered and they were really sort of they jumped out at me uh, but the more that we looked at them uh together Friederica the the more interesting they kind of became um I uh I wonder at this point uh knowing what you know now about the forms what would be what would be the first priority for the next step in elicitation to sort of move your understanding forward on this topic a little bit more. What would be the data that you would really want? I think the data that was most lacking for my elicitation was probably everything from Mugilanga, because we only had the last session to really focus on that, so we couldn't really go in depth. But also for Mukola, where I didn't really collect like more combinations with adjectives, I think that's something I would like to look at more. Yeah, I think that those are both uh, good areas. Um, and I should mention, if anybody has any questions or comments, do feel free to raise your hand. You can access that in the reactions uh, uh, by clicking the reactions button uh, here. Or if you have a, a question that you would like to um, write, you can write it in the uh, chat module of the Zoom application, and I'll read it out. Stanislav. Uh, thank you, Frederic, for for this presentation. So now I know what's special about the hair, about the animal, Omonyangala, because the, this character is special in Isanzu East African uh, tradition. Uh, it always functions as trickster. So the one who oversmarts other animals, despite being small and weak, and you know, this is the the, the common. Uh, food for wild animals, actually. They eat uh, these rabbits. But in, in the narratives, in folk uh, tales, it's the opposite. This small animal, harmless animal, kills the rest of the of the, king, of the animal kingdom. So maybe that's why there is no direct um, reference to this animal, just this euphemism, something like the crowned animal, in this sense. And, and I think that this gets... At the heart of it, Stanislav, like whatever whatever that means, whatever we break it down to, whatever sort of the etymological origin of that word is, like that's interesting. But almost what's just as interesting, or maybe if not more, is like why is this animal given this indirect form? We know that there are lots of Bantu languages that would just use a form like Sungura or Sungula. They would use a lexical form for that um, for that animal. So why do we get this? Why do we get this, like you said, almost like a euphemistic word or a circumlocution for the word for rabbit? What's what's going on there culturally or 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 whatever? I I find that I find that very very interesting. Frederica, do you have any any anything that you'd like to add or any thoughts on that? Not particular, but I agree it's very very interesting and something that I would also like to look in further. And uh, it makes me want to uh, to start looking for all the names of all the animals to see if there are more like this. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, it's really interesting. It jumps out, um, and pun intended. Lutz, um, do you uh, you have your hand up? Uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I mean, this is I mean, this this is really interesting as well. And I was thinking, even Sungura in the in Swahili, I'm not entirely sure where that comes from either. Um, and it would be nice to investigate that. Otherwise, I can't think, you know, I haven't looked at, I, you know, the classic example I know of, of animal metaphors and, and an avoidance language is sort of in French, the, the fox or the bear in Russian. That's sort of the classic textbook examples, maybe. So I think it's Renard is, is a person in, for the fox in French. And the medved is the, I think it's the honey eater or something for the for the bear. Um, yeah, so, so there are right. examples scattered in textbooks, but I, I don't think I, I haven't I can't think of anything in Bantu language. It's really interesting to follow that up as well. Um, but so my, my other question was more morphological, and that's about the and the data later you you have with the anga. So not this anga actually. This is confusing. And my only only sort of you know association well, exactly yeah those like in forty five. Um, is of course that we've seen that earlier in, in earlier presentations as a sort of habitual marker or, or progressive marker. So I wonder whether there's a link there somehow to to you know to to distinguish maybe between 
you know, sometimes people talk about what is this, you know, st stage level and individual level predicates, like in, you know, in formal semantics. So, so qualities which are either inherent or just assumed in a particular context. And you could think almost like, you know, the state of homelessness as being, you know, a characteristic of that person or a state in which they are, which is ascribed to them, but it's not maybe in, you know, integral to their identity. So that would maybe then, um, you know, I don't know if the semantics works, but that that would make sense to have like an habitual suffix playing in there somewhere. Oh, yes. Thank you for your feedback. That's indeed quite interesting and something to look into. Yeah, is it is it actually is it actually the ong that we've seen tacked on the end of verbs? The only thing that might that might uh, that might indicate that that's not the case is when Nico uh, would give us these forms, and when Nico gave us many forms, uh, he would break them down if he felt like they were if he felt like there were vowels running together. So he often used to say, "Oh well, this is like do not and don't." So I'm trying to think of like a good simple example here, uh, but if 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 words would run together, he'd break them apart. Whenever he was giving us these these mugilanga, he would say mugila anga nauli, and I find this interesting because we do get anga shows up in other places on its own sometimes in Ihanzu. Uh So, but again, just what you've what you've mentioned makes me think. Okay, well, is, is this the verbal anga, or is this the other strange anga that shows up in other places? Um, that that's that's useful and interesting. Another area to look at. Do you have any thoughts about that, Friederica? Not really. I would need to look into that. <laughs> Be just like another area to sort of uh, to sort of follow on. Um, do we have any other? Um, questions or comments uh, about the data that we saw or um, uh, about the analysis here. Um, Stephen. Yeah, I was just wondering whether, so the, do you have any idea what the actual kind of category of um, this, I suppose, putative root gila is? So is it kind of Predominantly nominal, or is it, yeah, verbal? Yeah. Or, I don't know. Yeah, what's going on? Yeah, there? Andrew and I talked about that a little bit, and we're both not. We didn't really come to a definitive answer, so it's kind of a deverbal construction was our idea. I should say, uh, and just for the record, I find Gila very interesting. So we see Gila in, um, we see Gila in. Um, in Ihanzu, meaning, you know, you can just use it with verbal morphology to indicate that I lack something. So, uh, but in these cases, yeah, you get, it looks like a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a nominal form. I should say that there are, um, that there are, uh, forms like Gila in the, in the Cushitic language that I work on, uh, a little bit further south and Gil, uh, First of all, is is a clan name, which I find interesting. So, well, it's it's a part of a word for a clan name, and they're the clan that um, often in 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 the clan sort of um, what's the word when they're listing them off? They're the ones that that people don't like for some reason. They're an unmarriageable clan. Uh, there's something there's something going on there that I need to look further at. But they're the they're the clan uh, that that people don't want to marry into. Um, but also gil is uh, is to argue or to or to quarrel in um in uh, in gorwa for example i don't know if there's a i don't know if there's a connection there but um i think it's kind of tantalizing for somebody who looks at more than one language just for the record on um, gil i i thought that was interesting when it came up yenica yeah, I I would, oh you go ahead uh, can, I just, yeah, can i just tag a tiny code on to that which is it's interesting that if it, if this is a verbal root that it's gila with a final a right and not a final e which you would as in letter i e um which i suppose is what you'd expect in a like a deverbal human noun right yeah, yeah sorry perfect. that was it yeah. decent point that's a decent point yenica you have uh, your hand up go for it yeah, hi. Um, I'm sorry to join late. I was teaching. Um, uh, just on the 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 gila part, um, lack uh, can typically also be uh, an auxiliary verb. Um, 
So that's what this looks like to me. And those auxiliary verbs behave in very different and strange ways. So that's another way of thinking about it. So that's a further uh, that's a further um, uh, path that we can go down there. Is it um, is it anga uh, as Nico would break it down? Is it some sort of um, is it that ang that we see at the end of verbs, or is it a full uh, auxiliary doing strange things, uh, or some sort of bizarre combination of of, of two or three of these? Uh, very cool, uh, Frederica. Do you have any thoughts on that? on how to separate Gila and Anga. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on how you would how you would even go about doing that? I'm not sure. I'm not so, so I'm not super familiar with Bantu languages. So I, I think I would need to read up more on that, how they work. Well given that we've only been working for a month on on the language, I think that already the stuff that you've managed to produce um is uh, really interesting. Uh, and incredibly useful, I think, for uh, whoever is going to take it on further, be that yourself or somebody else. Um, can we uh, go forward to when you were using these as subjects in a sentence here? I found this very interesting that um, when we tried to say something like the person who doesn't have money for the bus uh, stopped in Ibaga, we couldn't just simply we couldn't just simply say mugila matunda amutuka wahiya pangwibaga. You would have to use this adza, which is the past copula. So it was like he didn't have money, so he stopped in ibaga. I find this interesting that you can't use these forms as canon canonical subjects, or at least when Nico, when we gave these forms to Nico, he he very flatly refused to use these as canonical as subjects in any sort of straightforward way we would have to have some sort of copula at the beginning uh, so I find that I find that from a syntactic uh, perspective really interesting yeah and I'm I was wondering if because we have the mulia or mulito if, if we could use that as a subject in a sentence without the copula sometimes you know when uh sometimes you know when we when we have these uh, when we have these uh, presentations, we feel like we approach a, a resolution. And uh, I think with yours, which makes a fantastic final presentation, actually, Frederica, we we sort of feel like actually we're right at the very beginning of an interesting question here. Stephen, you have your hand up. Yeah, it's, it's just occurred to me. Do you have any forms where you get this occurring with the augment or not? I can't remember from. All of your data. So I should. So I I can say this. I can say this very quickly. You you can get this form with the augment. You can get the form with the augment, but the thing that is lacked, you can't get it with the augment. Right. Okay. That would be that would be the quickest answer to that. I'm not sure if you if your data backs that up, Frederica. But I guess we weren't really looking at that particularly, were we? Not really. We have the argument here, but yeah. Um, I don't see any further questions in the chat, and I don't see any hands raised. Um, if that's the case, then uh, I would uh, invite everybody to um thank our speaker uh once again for a a job well done.